does, how it relates to kind of embedded software and, and, and my stuff with doing uh, electronics. Kind of, um, I was originally a mechanical engineer and I worked in embedded software. And then Ada, I think might, if she, if there's an opportunity, might talk a little about mechanical engineering. But we'll see if we get to that. Um, so yeah, any questions before we start? Great. All right, keeping them, keeping it going. Great. Um, so uh, I wanted to just share a little bit about my my career uh, to get to extreme trucking, which is a startup in the Bay Area that works in semi trucks. Um, so I'm from the, uh, the Northern Virginia area. Um, shout out to Laura. Woo! 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 That's right, five seven one. Um, so yeah, so I'm from the Northern Virginia area. I went to school in Baltimore, Maryland. Uh, when I was there, I studied mechanical engineering, and I was involved in this off-road vehicle design team. I then worked went to work for Honda. How many people? Is anyone, does anyone own a Honda? A few Hondas, okay. Oh, I, I didn't make them. I, I just designed them. Um, but yeah, so I worked there as, a, as an underbody design engineer, which is like the mechanical, like figure out the crash structure. And then I also switched to be a, a test engineer. I got to like drive cars in Death Valley, where it's really hot to make sure they wouldn't overheat. So pretty, pretty intense job. We, like the, the car had all the camouflage on it. After doing that, I kind of pivoted my career. So that so was five years of mechanical, very hardcore mechanical engineering. I pivoted that into getting more involved in electronics. And I got to work for a company called Polaris Snowmobiles. They're really, really far north. Um, they're, it's really cold there if you ever decide to go there. It's like, uh, they're, they're not happy. They're so cold that they're not happy if it, the temperature is above zero. So they, they need to like to freeze. They do a lot of like ice sports and stuff. Um, so that was only 11 months, a little cold. And then from there, I've gotten a job in California, in the Bay Area. So kind of working my way further west. And now I work as an embedded systems engineer with extreme trucking. Yeah, any questions about my journey to California? Oh man, we're just crushing it. <laughs> cool, so um, I had a little bit different of a journey. Um, my, um, I'm actually from Florida. Uh, my family's from Venezuela, so you see that over here. Um, I went to school at Johns Hopkins. I studied mechanical engineering. His name is Adam. We overlapped only a little bit at school. Um, but I also moved to Ohio. I actually worked for a, um, a company developing a teeth whitening product. I really wanted to work for a startup, so um, after getting my mechanical engineering degree and doing an additional year um, studying engineering management and uh, was actually part of an entrepreneurship program where I looked at uh, business operations and accounting and product design and how all of those things come together to create products that actually make money and um, make a company around. Will actually use them. So I learned all of these things in school and applied them at the startup that I worked at, um, making a funding product in Ohio. Um, I worked there for three years. Um, really like working at a startup. Bay Area is the hub of that, so I came over here um, about a year and a half ago and started working as a mechanical engineer there with Adam. Um, and now I work on the truck wings. Yeah. Also, uh, I have a race yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty sick. Um, so yeah, so let's get into kind of what track wings do. So, uh, so, so like I mentioned, this is a, this is a small startup with about 20 people. Um, what we do is uh, our main value add is we have this product that goes on the back of semi trucks that are these folding wings that stay closed when the truck is driving at low speed, but at high speed, the wings automatically open. So when you're driving, you, when you're driving on the highway, you go past a big truck. You can sometimes see there's this gap that exists between the cab and the trailer. So what our device does is we have these automatic folding panels that, that open to seal that gap between the cab and the trailer. What's pretty cool about that is um, the reason we do that is to improve aerodynamic efficiency, but what's neat is that uh, this whole thing does it automatically. So when they slow down, they're actually able to wings close without any driver interaction. So it's kind of like, like your privacy guys are working. So um, this is just a quick um, summary of like kind of the team that we have. So you can see this is that we all look great in our polos. We forgot our polos today, or are really underdressed. But this is what we normally wear to work at our startup. Um, so it's pretty, so if you like wearing casual kind of clothes, consider working at the startup. Um, so yeah, so then as you can kind of see, we all are all working together of the different projects. And now we're gonna get kind of the meat potatoes of like, okay, so how, how, how does this relate to loose stamp? Like Adam, what, we, you're a great talker. We really think you're entertaining. But how does it? What can we actually gain from your talk other than just a few laughs? Um, so what I wanted to share is so it's been really cool. Uh, Dave asked me to come by to talk about kind of the process that we do to get to an actual product on that we're actually able to deploy to you know, hundreds of units in the field. And you're going to find it's remarkably similar to the steps you guys are taking 
it's you, in your the very blue stamp project. So what we did is we started off with a uh, small breadboard, with a breadboard that worked all the electrical components, kind of getting them all wired up independently. We slowly moved that forward with a series of um, you know different breakout boards and generally got it all working together. Then we put it into Eagle. We tested that all the components would all fit. Are, is anyone going to be making a printed circuit board for their project? Or no? No? OK, good one. All right, maybe. Well, see, see, how, see how it feels. It's a big step. Um, but yeah, so, so obviously printed circuit boards are you can take your normal, is this what most of your guys' projects are kind of looking like? A lot of wires, yeah, yeah. What's neat is this and, and this are obviously equivalent, but this, the one on the right is much smaller. Yes? Um, maybe they know by the name PCB. A pr print circuit board is PCB. Yes. So ask that question again because I think they didn't realize that. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Um, are any of the folks going to be including a printed circuit board or PCB in their project? In their project? All right. A few more hands. Man. You guys just decided just now to put that. <laughs> anyway, exactly. But you're exactly right. So you guys are familiar with some of these steps. What's really cool is that those same steps you're learning here at the high school level. You could apply today to get a product in the in the market. So we have the um, you know this is kind of an image when I I was super stoked when they all came in. So I laid them all on the table to kind of get that you know Instagram background shot of uh, all all of them like. Choo, 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 choo. But yeah, and what's neat is we actually have these. Um, we were able to set up a full assembly line. They were, they were the, the the printed circuit boards, the PCBs were made in um, made made overseas. Came to Mexico, they assembled the boxes, they tested them, they did all this different work. You know, we designed a 3D printed enclosure, and yeah, it was a pretty cool opportunity from this, like, from this, this from like the, the hardware perspective, and this, this, this is what the final product box looks like that uh, that goes into the truck. So it's pretty, but it's pretty very similar to the exact step that you guys are learning right now, which is pretty neat. Um, next, I want to talk about the firmware. So the, the the neat thing is that what you just saw is kind of the hardware perspective, like what sort of capacitors do you use, what resistors, LEDs, etc. But then of course, as you guys all know, you got to still program it. So what's really neat about what we do is we use a um, we uh, our device connects to the, 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 the these these units. We put them in a truck, and unlike you know uh, maybe a, a a smart speaker or um, a smart dishwasher, these kind, or like a thermostat which are static components, like you know where they are, they're not moving. We put it in, a, in, in, a, in something that drives 5,000 miles a week. Like, these things is moving all So if there is ever a mistake, or we want to make a change to it, we have to, we have to figure out a way, how would we change the software, or how would we be, be, be getting data from our device when it's in this situation? And what we decided on, we decided on connecting it to, uh, to the, we connect it over the same network your cell phone uses. We use 3G. So, the device is constantly outputting information. So this is kind of what's neat is, this is like, you definitely, I mean, you guys heard like Internet of Things, kind of, this is a very much, you know, this is a thing of the Internet of Things. And so yeah, what's great is we have our device, it's in the field, it sends data back to us, we're able to see how it's working, and then we're able to tell our customer, hey, here's how effective your truck wings were in the field. So it's really neat, it's, that, and that's super powerful to be able to make something that because of the cellular network that exists, <coughs> is able to measure itself, report on how well it's doing, and inform the customer, hey, this is doing great. And I think we have like a high expectation value that we just expect that to happen nowadays. But what's really cool is that there is that expectation. And with a little bit of like taking different services and combining them together with like, you know, REST APIs and like how you hold data, kind of a plus alpha after your you know, you do your software, the, the hardware design, the software design, and then kind of going the one step further to the internet. It's a big jump, but that's where the real magic is to make it an IoT device. So yeah, it's also pretty cool. So we've got all this, all these sensors packed into the truck, and yeah, it's uploading information. What's also really cool is we have a, a, t a technique where we're able to, let's say, uh, you guys working with Arduinos, what's the way you normally program? So the USB cable, you hook up your computer, you know, compile, so what, 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 what would you do, what would you do if your, you know, your device wasn't by you? Do you have to just get a really, really long USB cable? I can like flag them down and be like, I think I need to update your, do you set your, you set your thumb drives, ask them to update, no, that's, that's not going to work. We figured out a way to actually do over the air software updates, where actually we have a console where we can tell the device in the field, hey, you need to get updated. It will like, okay, it'll download it, and it'll bloop. Now it's running the new software. Super cool, and that that's like feels very, very, very powerful. So that, that's called OTA or over-the-air updating. 
uh, over the air, oh, uh, sorry, it's, it's weird. It's over, that's the O, the is the T, and A is air, so over the air. I don't know why the gets its own capital letter, but um, yeah, so, so that, that's kind of what we do for uh, different programming the microcontroller stuff, which is pretty neat. Um, any questions about kind of that? That was a quick run through of different things. Yeah, go ahead. So, you have a question about the over the air updates. Yeah. Um, what, what if the person's currently driving? Would it still uh, tap the update? So we're really lucky. The software, so we use the particle electron. We've leveraged heavily on the particle platform. Is anyone else using a particle here? Oh really? Oh man! All right, all right, all right, great. I'm using the particle photon to connect with the lights. Yeah, exactly. So you 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 use the over the air update capability of the photon? Uh, yeah. Yeah, it's that, exactly. So and um and uh, do, 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 do 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 what have you observed what? Does it seem to do when you add new software to it? It starts blinking. Okay. <laughs> Very true. But it seems like what's neat about this, so they have a, a real time operating system on, on, on RTOS that's actually built to, they have onboard memory on the chip that's already set up, and it will take in your code and it will continue. It depends on how you configure the settings. When we have our settings configured, the wings are still running until it, while it's downloading, and then it resets and now it flips over. So it's very clever that it doesn't, it can, and so if it, say a download fails, like let's say you're driving and you go out of cell phones and as it's downloading, it's no problem. It doesn't, it doesn't get upset by that. So it's very, it's very clever. So this brings up a good point of these actually technologies are very accessible. Like you're in high school and you're doing over the air updates. Like that used to be the realm of like DARPA, like in the 80s, you know, um, being able to, you know, send and reprogram stuff remotely. Um, that's not to say that it's, it's, it's easy. There obviously are errors that, 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 that can occur. But the neat thing is that we actually, even as a startup, like this is real money involved, we're leveraging other services that you have access to. Like, we, we use off-the-shelf solutions all the time to rapidly develop something. So it can be intimidating when you like see a Tesla Model 3, you're like, oh man, Elon must have a firmware update and now it can play Space Invaders. Like, how did he do that? Like, but it's like, actually, you know, like, there's a, there, 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 there's a baby version, which is like, you know, little steps at a time. And so we leverage, and we're not, we're not Tesla, but what's cool is that we're able to punch above our weight by leveraging services that other folks have. And this trend of technologies that seem really difficult being accessible is going to continue to happen, especially in the kind of, especially in the connectivity space. So yeah, any other questions? Hi. How do, so the actual like uh, truck wings are they attached to the like truck itself, or do you can you add it to any truck? Um, yes. Absolutely, and that's actually one of the things we'll talk, we'll talk about. The, 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 the thing Eddie can answer that question best. Awesome. Um, so the truck wings, we have different models of truck wings. So different trucks are slightly different, uh, but they are mounted on the back of the of the tractor of the truck um, on these brackets that go on it, and then the panels can swivel on those brackets. Um, so a slightly different truck might need like a smaller bracket or a bigger bracket, uh, and we take into account you know what what are the mechanical supports that are available inside of the truck. We need to support things in slightly different ways because of different models. Um, so we kind of have these custom truck wings for each different model of truck, uh, and we look for those trucks um, to buy our products that we already have. Or if not, we'll design a new one that works for them. Questions? Do you have any mechanical signs? I was going to just hover over. I don't. Them. No, no, no. This is perfect. Right. So, so if you um, maybe just talk about some of the challenges you get have from. Yeah. Uh, cool. So um, one of the things that I've been looking at in the past week is um, galvanic corrosion. I don't know if any does anyone have a product that has to be outdoors or um, near water. Electronics don't like water very much. Well, if you do, you better listen up. <laughs> but if you do, um, you have to consider things like you know, is it going to be in our trucks? Um, you use in places with snow, you use salt on the road. Um, and there's, uh, when salt water gets on metal parts like bolts or nuts, it can cause corrosion. So I'm having some issues with that. Um, so we have to, you know, put special finishes or use plastic or nylon washers instead of metal, uh, and that's stuff that kind of comes up in the operation of the truck. Uh, things that resist water are difficult to make. So what's neat is, you know, um, we're kind of coming to the tail end, and then we want to have time for your questions. So what's really neat about what we do at Extreme Tracking, um, we're obviously a pretty small team, but what's been really cool is that we have a product that is a mechanical system. You just heard it kind of describing something on the completely other end, where like she has to worry about things like galvanic corrosion, 
as the salt spray on the road. Um, there's all sorts of other inter uh, um, other sorts of sourcing things, like getting these large mounts made to hold this is sometimes expensive. Figuring out the right sourcing capability, uh, how they're going to be assembled, and like tolerance is another thing. So we have one side of the spectrum where this product has to do these mechanical things, and on the other side, you're dealing with stuff that I'm working on right now, which is like how can I get this information up to the internet in like the lowest amount of data? Can I binary encode it? What's really fascinating is that this product kind of in one way, it could just be a purely mechanical product, but because it has the addition of the extra electronics, the type of stuff that you guys are working on, you can take no, what we quote unquote, air, air quotes like your kind of historically mechanical things, and it makes it smarter to where these wings, you can install these wings with just some sort of simple like driver, the driver could control, but now he would have to automatically do it, he would make a mistake, so ours is automatic, and now also, it automatically writes down how much fuel it saves, so it really kind of takes that product to the next level. So as you're thinking, uh, last year I saw tons of products that were very cool, like that were mechanical things that were just a little bit addition of electronics and connected to the internet and extra like you know nuance really made them uh, pretty pretty incredible. So this is a real world example of that happening with the extreme trucking truck wings. So yeah, any questions? Yeah, go ahead. So what type of data do you receive from the wings, and like what do you do with the data? Yeah, so we actually get a lot of all data, not, not from the wings necessarily, we get our data from the truck itself. We connect to the truck's CAN network. So we record the truck's speed, its odometer, we know its fuel consumption, we know how much you're steering the, we know how much you're turning the steering wheel. And there's all this data that we know how, what time, the la when the last oil change was. So there's all this like maintenance data that's siloed. So one of the opportunities we have for, for monetizing this is we actually want to install truck wings as like an introduction to the fleets that, uh, to, that deliver a clear return on investment of directly, directly start saving the money, and then start to add subscription services on top of that. So we look at, the main things we look at right now are mostly fuel consumption and speed and odometer, but there's a lot of uh, other parameters that, the, your, that your, car, or your car or truck knows that we can leverage by being this uh, gateway um, on the vehicle to say, to say uh, what it's doing. You have a sensor that tells us if there's a trailer or not. That's right. There, I guess there is one thing for the truck. <laughs> we have a sensor that says how far the, the wing, how far back the trailer is to know if it's safe to open. Yeah. Uh, how does, so I saw like the box that goes like in the actual like tractor, like where the guy is controlling the truck. Yes. So how does that like communicate with the wings? Is it like Bluetooth or is it like a Cable or You'd think it'd be Bluetooth, but it's, it's just a cable right now. We so we haven't we would there's a lot there we one of our opportunities for improvement is to make that wireless. Um, but currently it is a we drill a hole and we like run a harness back to it. How, how long is the harness? It's like thirty feet. It's pretty long. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a lot of wires. Um, but yeah, yeah. Yes. So um, since it's currently just the wings, right, from our side, um, and but you still communicate via three G. Um, are those costs usually like offset by the initial fixed cost, which is the um, the cost of links? So fortunately, we're still a startup, so you're right. We don't actually have. You're right. <laughs> Great question. So we do have revenue on selling the wings, but currently the data cost we eat the data cost. So we data cost. Our data cost is three dollars per per truck. So we eat that currently. Um, but yeah, but it, you're right. We need. To, how do you offset? You would want to offset those with some sort of service. And what's what's where the point we're at right now is. Um, you can build lots of different services. We're actually working to partner out, partner out actually asking the fleets what features they want. Because actually that's sometimes the hardest part. Tech, there's, there, there are technical challenges, like you know, building a fusion reactor, big technical challenge. Not, but like there are other problems, which is like, do people, what do people want? Where does he want to spend? Like, do people want Snapchat to change its you know, organization? Like, big mistake, shouldn't have done that. But like basically, like, gender, like, but like gender swap, like wow. Amazing feature. Like the person that was like, there was a there was a board meeting, or there was a meeting at some point that happened. Like, you know what's cool, guys? Gender swap face filter. And they were like, oh my gosh, we gotta we gotta work on that right away. We got all this customer data that says that that's exactly what they want. So um, so so but 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 there are other, there are other features that that hit flat and they miss it. But so you have to think of these, even though they are digital, like they're free to you. There's a lot of investment in time and money that goes into choosing those features. So in our case, how do we? get this, this data service, how do we start to make sure that we're actually not losing money on just having 3G network connectivity? That's what we're actively working on right now. Yes? What's like the profit margin on the actual production of the wings like without this, the data? So, so, so 
what we need it to be is uh, you typically want to have 100% profit margin. So if you sell something for 40 bucks, you need to, at the worst case scenario, make it cost 20 bucks. So we're not there yet. But that would be what we'd want our profit margin to be. And, I, and it's a good rule of thumb, it's 100% profit margin. Yeah. How many trucks are you on at the moment? Thousands. Thousands. I can't give you an exact number, but it's over now. Okay. Yeah. So I'm assuming the wings are flexible in some way, or like, is it? Does it notice? So like, do you have two separate distance sensors that are, that are kind of like making sure that the distance is the same? Will they like be constantly orienting itself if the truck needs to turn? The, so the wings are flexible to some extent, but they need to be stiff enough to right. um, to actually be like an aerodynamic surface. So they're flexible to some extent, but um, they're mostly rigid. We we rely on the distance sensor to give us like the green light to say like, yep, there's nothing here. The, the gap between the tractor and the trailer is big enough. Uh, go ahead and open so you don't hit anything. So you don't really have to be very flexible to achieve that. So is it a distance sensor that aerodynamic performance doesn't change? Does it, is it a distance sensor that goes across? So like, or is it multiple distance sensors? Like where is the distance sensor position that you can measure like a, a turn? It's, it's right in the middle. And it looks right at the trailer. So how is it that if the if the bed, I mean maybe I don't understand how trucks. Are, no, no, it's not right. Um, but <laughs> if the storage, like if the if the cab's like this and the thing turns back, the middle's going to stay the same. The pivot point will stay the same. Mm -hmm. Whereas the other parts of the of the storage part will. Right, we right. close before that. We gotcha. close the speed. Because, so because we read that the truck is slowing down. Right. So when the truck is slowing down, you know you're no longer at highway speed. You no longer need that. Um, so even if there's a curve on the high, because like there are some. Pretty crazy highways that still turn and truck still going like 65 miles an hour. Almost not, it, it, it barely moves. Yeah. Okay. But like it's like you type of taking a taking a stoplight. Right. A real. I totally. Yeah. You're, you're, you're not, not really. <laughs> <laughs> right, slow down. Slow down. Okay. Yeah. Great, great question. Uh, yeah. In the back. What material is the wings actually made of? Is it fabric or is it something like a? a I'm coming next. Don't worry. There is a thing. Uh, it's a. It's a. It's a. Yeah. So the material of the wings. It's a uh, fiberglass composite. So it's plastic, but it's reinforced with um, with fiberglass to make it more stiff. Yeah. What was your question? Uh, what about maintenance? So like because like the trucks are like, driving all over the U.S. So you say that again? Oh, what about maintenance? Like how are you gonna fix it if something breaks? Yeah, yeah that's a we question. have a guy. Guy, <laughs> 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 that's our our solution so far has been to have this guy who goes, like things are broken. And you're absolutely right. How do you how do you balance how do you balance pushing units out that because you're going to discover problems that are not there when you first start. Yeah, we have a guy that we, we, we found someone in, in North Carolina. He loves getting on the road and going to fix problems. He's really good at it, too. <laughs> <laughs> what would happen if it did break and it wasn't noticed right away? Yeah, yeah. well, the material, well, I guess that, that, that has happened. Um, so. so we actually, that's when we start to rely on documentation and making sure that... Documentation, guys! Documentation is really important. So we make sure that when we install this product, um, we go to the customer, we walk them through how it works, uh, we leave them with some documentation. When they ask us, we have a customer service line, they, if there's any issues that they see, um, they call us and you know, we send them some of the documentation that's specific to the problem that they're having um, so that they, you know, if the issue is small enough, then they can learn about it and they can solve it themselves. But you do need really good documentation and photos and good communication to make sure that the customer can take care of of an issue that they see, um, and if we can't take care of it that way, you know, then we fly on our end. We did not pay them to say this. <laughs> this is real life. And then in the back, when you have one more question? Oh, uh, I was going to mention, worst case scenario, what, let's say the car story wise, the distance sensor breaks, or distance, yeah. sensor, distance sensors break, um, but they detect that everything's fine. And so, it, it then slows down, the wings don't close, it tries to make a turn. What would happen in that sort of scenario? What would happen? This has never happened. That has never, what never happened. About? That's never happened before. <laughs> but um, yeah, we're actually lucky. The way that the, the, the construction, uh, there's a weak, there's a, uh, wasn't intentional, but there's a weak point that our, our wing would break in a very easy to replace area. Oh. And it, it looks really sad when it happens, but it's, it's actually very easy to replace this one part that gets like, <laughs> <laughs> so We can replace that. And then it goes back to where you, but it is always sad. When, and we, we, we had a lot of filtering. We had to try and figure out early on if like, they call us and be like, hey, like, we had a wing hit. We're like, fly the guy out and uh, <laughs> fix the, figure out what happened. We had to like, go through the software and be like, why didn't, why didn't the wings close? So we actually do a lot of work on the software side to look at those edge cases. And then solve it with software. 
Because we can do over the air updates. So we, we, one, one problem on one track fixes all the trucks. Mm -hmm. So like, you're, just, you're dealing with like trucks going at like 60 miles, 70 miles an hour like on the freeway. So like, what if, is there a scenario where something happens where like it can be potentially dangerous like to the driver or other cars? Like, I, don't, I don't know enough about like the mechanics of this. No, 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 no. Um, yeah, so that, no, but, that, but that is something we really did think a lot about. The, similar, the same way like your suspension on your car, if you're if you get a pothole hard enough, can your tire hit you? Like so, car manufacturers are really no, no, but not just fall off. But like, if you get in that, like, the, 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 like if you hit a pothole hard enough and something fails, will it fail in a way that doesn't like pull your gas line? Like, you don't put a fuel line by something that could get ripped off. So we actually think a lot about that exactly. Those questions of how do you balance the worst case scenario with maybe external th th things totally outside of your control? Like, what if they're slowing down and they jackknife? And that's why we're really lucky that when we have had these impacts, we can see that it, the trailer's fine. It's our, our part that gets damaged, that's software. But, but that, that is something that we think a lot about to, for the, 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 how the, the nuts and bolts that hold on to it. Like the, the fittings are stacked a certain way to last for five years. And that's the galvanic frozen that he was talking about that we think a lot about. Yeah, so, so our component is a, it saves fuel, but it's not like a safety critical component. So when you're engineering things, you have to make sure that you're not, um, especially when, it's, when you're adding something to a product, uh, you know, maintain the safety of the original product. Um, so yeah, the worst thing that could happen is that the truck wings don't work. Maybe you don't get as many fuel savings anymore until we fix it. Um, so for example, one thing we thought about is uh, the way that we open our wings is with pneumatic actuators. So they connect to the air supply, the compressor on the actual truck. So the trucks use air brakes um, to brake both the truck and the trailer. So uh, one thing we didn't do is hook up to the air brakes air system because then we would be messing with a safety critical component or safety critical system. Uh, we actually hook up to the auxiliary air system that, you know, even if something goes wrong, your brakes are still working perfectly fine. So we are um, designing the product specifically not to interfere with any of the safety critical systems of the truck. Ending right. on a happy note, what's your favorite part of your job or the funnest part? Oh man, I think the fa my favorite part of my job is I get to solve a lot of, I get to definitely solve a lot of problems and the opportunity to have real ownership of knowing like my thing is doing its thing. Like it's really neat. I've, I worked at some big companies and when I was with Honda, you know, if you, I don't know if anyone has a minor model change uh, 2013 to 2015 Honda Odyssey, but I worked on that hood. But like, and that's like a small part, you're probably part of a bigger team, but it's not if you really get the chance to, to really own kind of a huge portion of it. So I get a lot of pride of having my, what, I, what I work on being on the road. I think my favorite part of my job is uh, we're, we're a small company still, and we still get a lot of visibility into what's going wrong. So if something happens, or there's an issue that came up, or something that went really well in the field, some, some customer said something, I do get to hear about it. Um, and I get if it's a problem, I get to have the choice to take initiative and like participate in how we solve that problem, whether it's a sales problem or a, a Carbon Connect problem, or, or you know, if it's like yeah, those never I can still have input. I can still have input and choose to learn about something and how to how to problem solve in different um, kind of fields, not just my mechanical engineering panels um, job, which I definitely do, and, it, and it's great, and I learn a lot about it. But um, just the the ability to solve different problems and take initiative and have that impact is, I think, the coolest part of my job. All right, that's all I have. to go outside, have everyone be like behind us, or what's the agenda? Yeah, sure. Yeah, we can. You guys cool with that? Yeah. All right, cool. You guys are great. Thanks so much. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah. Everyone you can look us up at TalkWings.com. Add it to your food mark browser. No,